Well, if you live in the Houston area, you are familiar with weather events. I call them the, the three H's of living in Houston, hurricanes, heat, and humidity. Rare, though, is that we deal with the cold. We really don't know how to deal with cold very well. Anybody north of us makes fun of us for the way that we deal with cold, right? Some of you are implants from other places, and you just laugh at how we deal uh, with cold. We don't know how to drive in it. Last year, my kid's school decided to cancel school. It was 35 degrees, y'all. I mean, humidity means it's going to be 30 or so, 28 to 30 before the overpasses on little roads have any ice or anything on them, but we cancel school at 35. I just think they wanted a day off. The kids are pretty stoked about it. But the great Texas freeze of February 2021 was a different thing, wasn't it? Ruined your Valentines, I know. The Arctic blast, whatever you called it, that was a different thing. There were 10 million people in the state of Texas without power. For days and days at a time, we had 15 to 20 degree temperatures. For days at a time, there was no heat. We lost power. We had no water. Hopefully, you put some water in your bathtub. There was no water. Many of your pipes busted. We are not built for this, were we? I had a small little generator small one. And so I could run my little space heaters, like two or three of them. We put them all in the, the living room and we ran our propane fireplace at night. And interestingly enough, you know, I've been through hurricanes, I've been here 20 something years, like I've been through hurricanes and heat and all these things. But there was something different about this, at least in my own anxiety and worry. I'm like, this is bad. We barely, ha- we don't have water minus what's in the tub. I got a Berkey, that's good. But we're in trouble. Like, this is dangerous. When I realized for my family that most of our basic needs and necessities were gone, we didn't have access to that. And and you think about the rare times that this kind of thing happens to us. You think about COVID when it happened. You think about hurricanes when it happened, where you can't get at gas. There's nothing at the HEB. And it begins to create an anxiety, and a worry in us for basic necessities. Listen, we don't live in that very much, but we realize in those moments, man, the the logistical chain isn't so deep, is it? And that's where we become hoarders, and that's where we go get rice from Costco and spend thousands of dollars, maybe rightfully so, to prepare for things like that. Let me ask you, in the great freeze in Texas in 2021, or these kinds of events, how do you do? How do you cope? What is your natural reflex to these kind of basic challenges and anxieties and worries that that come around? Do you plan? Do you prepare? Do you worry? At what point do you, you begin praying? Think about those events. Think about the Arctic blast. When did you start praying? Did you start praying at any point? To God our Father who says that he will provide our basic needs. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, and we'll finish up here. Chapter 6 of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount for us, verses 25 through 34. Page 811, if a Bible in your chair close to you. And Jesus is going to press in to worry, to anxieties. Maybe you know this text. Don't be anxious. He says it three different times. What's God's word have to say about our worries about our anxieties that creep in. I know nobody here worries about anything, right? Not a soul. Man, anxiety, anxiety is almost like the air we breathe. We've domesticated anxiety and worry down to this normalcy of almost like breathing, haven't we? We just view it as a normal part of life. And in one sense, it is a normal part of the brokenness of life, but we tend to find vices to deal with it that aren't so healthy, right? A strong drink, an overdone hobby. And when that doesn't work, when it gets worse, we medicate it. I'm not even saying that's wrong. Or we go talk to someone, but it can become, as many of you know, as I know, debilitating in your life when it just stores up anxiety and worry. How's Jesus 
on worry and anxiety? What's he's going to say about our anxiety? How much of what Jesus is going to say is going to sound like the counselor you might go to? And how much of what Jesus is going to say doesn't sound anything like the counselor you might go to? And what do we do with that rub where Jesus may be at odds with the way that we tend to think about anxiety and worry? What do we do with that when God's word says one thing and the world says another thing? See, I think some of Jesus' words here, when we first read them and remember them, they may rub a bit on our 21st century sensibilities. And they may rub a bit on what we hold dear and what we really believe or the assumptions that we make about anxieties, but there are beautiful truths here when we apply them rightly or are just beautiful antidotes to the anxiety and the worries that we every day face in our lives. And so today, Jesus gets down to the root cause of anxieties. He gets down to its antidote as well. Praise God. Let's check it out. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25, and I'm going to read till 32, and then we'll pick it up in a minute from there. Jesus on being anxious. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or, nor about your body, what you will put on, clothes. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the, look at the examples. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He cares for them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Of which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your lifespan? You might lessen it, actually. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies or wildflowers of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon, picture this, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you, underline this, of little faith. Therefore, don't be anxious. There it is again, second time. Stop being anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, unbelievers, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Your first thought this morning is this. Worry or anxiety is energized by a lack of faith in God's providential care over us. This is the first point that Jesus is making, that it's energized, this anxiety that's somewhat natural for us that rises up in a broken world and our broken hearts is energized by a lack of faith in God's care over us. Here's what we're not saying. I just want to clarify a few things when you read this. When you read this, you, you kind of, this whole text, you kind of, like last week, you think, I'm just supposed to be passive. And I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying be idle and lazy. He's not saying don't plan, but he is saying that God, our Father, is a good Father, and he takes care of his children. He takes care of his children's basic needs, like in a hurricane, like in an Arctic blast, your basic needs. Notice he's not talking about wants and luxuries. He's talking about basic needs. He takes care of his children. Speaking of children. Maybe you've been around or near, or maybe you've been a part of this in your own family, in your own life, adoption or foster care. And you receive a child into your home that has not been cared for, that has not received basic needs like food or shelter or care from their parents. And oftentimes, interesting things happen in that particularly with something like food. What happens to a kid when they have been malnourished or they haven't had food like they should, they have a lot of anxiety about food that that seems foreign to us who've always had three square meals and food on our plate. When it's time to eat, they begin asking questions like, what are we having? And you can see it on their face that there's anxiety about food. Is there enough food? When they want a snack, oftentimes kids in that place 
They hide food, not because they're hungry, oftentimes. They hide food because they don't want to be without, because they experience what it looks like and what it feels like to be without, so they'll hide food. You know the actor Sidney Poitier, multimillionaire, later in life, standing before a crowd, he said, I still have a Snicker bar in my pocket, just in case. Closer to dimmer time, anxiety. Why? Because the basic needs of this child have not been met. And yet God our Father says here, he provides and cares for his children that he will take care of your basic needs, food, shelter, clothing. And so what's at stake here and what he's talking about when he says you lack faith, you lack faith in the very character of God, that God is good, that God cares for his own, providentially, meaning he has power to change circumstances. You look at this text in verse 25, and I said it, that three times in this text, Jesus says, don't be anxious. It's like, it's, it's, it's an imperative command. It's a present tense command. It's an imperative, so it's a continual action. And you look at that and you go, it's not that easy, right? It's, don't be anxious, isn't that easy in my life? But Jesus is literally saying, stop it. What do I do with that? He's literally saying, stop being anxious. And he's going to say some other things that help us understand kind of the rub of that hard statement, stop it. He's going to give us some antidotes to fill it because he doesn't just say stop it and not help us understand what to do with it. In verse 34, he's actually going to say, hey, you're always going to have trouble. You're always going to have anxiety looming and present. It's just what you do with it. And later in the New Testament, you see this command over and over and over, and it seems harsh to our ears and to our experience. Where Paul in Philippians says, don't be anxious. It's not the full picture. We'll get to the full picture. So bear with me for a little bit, okay? But Jesus is saying his command. Here's why. Because the root cause, he's saying, is you of little faith. The root cause is our unbelief and God's providential care of us as his children. And I think he's speaking to believers. I think he's speaking to people who who are not only made in the image of God, but have been remade in the image of his son who receive care from the Lord. And look at the examples he gives to show the people who are living in that day. Remember, we're on the Sermon on the Mount. So you got people sitting there outside in nature. And notice and remember this. In first century, in first century, people, most of these people, most people in first century, like most people today, unlike you and me, lived day to day. They were day laborers. You ever seen the day laborers down the street who go and get a job for today? They were day laborers. And they were looking for a job to work that day. So the end of that day, they would be paid so that they could go to the market and get food and have food that night. And have clothing, more than one basically item of clothing, shirt, pants, shoes. So these people understand the need and the anxiety from basic needs, that's so foreign to us, isn't it? Like we may live month to month, we're coming up to the end of the month, we're about to pay bills. Sorry, I'm giving you anxiety. Most of us, at worst, live month to month. We don't live like that, day to day. We live month to month, and some of us don't worry about it at all, and that's a blessing. But that's what's going on in the first century. So Jesus is pressing into something that is real to them, that is palatable to them day by day. Don't worry about food and clothing and shelter. And you and I say, yeah, don't worry about that. But for them, there is anxiety for them in that. Here's the interesting thing. For you and me, we don't put anxiety there. We just put it in luxuries, right? We just put it in wants because we don't have to worry about some of those things maybe until the Arctic blast. So look at the examples Jesus gives these people to go, hey, don't fret about it, I got you. The heavenly Father has you. He gives a couple of examples. He gives the examples of birds. So all people have to do sitting there at the Sermon on the Mount is look up at the birds. It says birds don't cultivate, do they? They don't sow and reap. 
And here's the interesting thing. Sometimes people in this text, they look at birds and go, well, they don't do anything. Have you ever watched a mom and dad cardinal, we have one in our backyard, or some families in our backyard, every year when they have babies, you know what they're doing all day? They're going and cultivating, and they're going and getting food for the, for the babies. Birds are active. They're not idle. So don't miss that. So birds aren't idle, but it's still God who has to provide for them and care for them. And the message is, if God's going to provide for a, a crow, actually Luke says a raven. I don't like those things. Do you like those things? Peck on your window. They're kind of lowly, right? If God cares for the raven, even the raven, the little thing, thinking care for you, the one who's more valuable, and yes, God thinks we're more valuable, keeps going. He goes to lilies or wildflowers. These aren't what you grow in your garden, which you care for. These are wildflowers. Wildflowers aren't cared for by people. God sends the rain. God sends them nourishment to grow. And look at what he says about even these wildflowers, that they're arrayed even more than Solomon. Solomon was the richest man on the world, and clothing was a big deal for status in that day. In the Old Testament, nobody had more than Solomon. Nobody dressed better. Sorry, where, where am I dressing? Where's Beakley? Okay, we got... Where's, I'm not, I won't mess with the ladies. I won't do that. But the lilies of the field, not even the ones in your garden, God takes, they're more beautiful than anything Solomon could wear. That's God taking care of lilies. And look at what happens with this grass, these lilies. These, this grass of the field, today's alive and tomorrow it's gone because back then, like we do today, they had kindling. And what they did is they took the grass, and they used it to begin fires. And so even things that are going to come and pass away, God cares for. And so what's the implication? It's obvious. How much more will God care for your basic needs? He's a heavenly father who's providential. That means that he's working in this world. He's powerful to weave, to take care of your basic needs, and he calls us to trust us with, with some simple examples. If he's willing to take care of all these little things, how much more will he take care of us? You know, it's interesting. Uh, when I think particularly about the birds in this text, it, it reminds me of this poem I heard a long time ago. It's called Overheard in the Orchard by Elizabeth Cheney. And it's two birds talking to one another. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. The animals know that God cares for them. How much more will God care for us, his children? So why do we worry about our needs? This may be controversial in the world that we live in. But Jesus says that the root cause for his children to have anxiety and to worry, it's right there in the text, not my words, his words, oh, you of little faith. The root cause is unbelief at its root, right? And I'm going to get to some other things. It's a lack of faith and his character, and his provision, and maybe it's also, I've got to do it, right? I've got to take care of my own needs. Well, guess what? That leads to worry and anxiety. And when we think about this, this phrase, O ye of little faith, you've seen it before? In Matthew, you see it like four different times. It's Jesus' number one correction for his disciples. Remember when the winds and the wave came in the storm? And Jesus is chilling, man. He's asleep. And they turn to him, what are you going to do about this? And he says what? Oh, ye of little faith. And he calms the winds and the waves. Remember when the 5,000 are sitting there on the hill and the disciples are all worried and anxious because there's a lot of people and they're all hungry. And Jesus says, bring me 
a couple loaves and five fishes. And they're like, what's, what's he going to do with that? Oh, ye little faith. And what does he do? He multiplies the bread and the fish, and he feeds everyone. Oh, ye of little faith. Unbelief is really at the root of much of our worry. And do you consider when you read the Gospels, have you gotten to the place where you go, would I be that different than them? I don't think I would. I used to think that I would. I don't think so. Can I tell you three things? I'm going to just give you three practical things. I'll tell you three things that I do with my worry and my anxiety. Things that I say to myself that are really marks of, of unbelief functionally. The first thing I say sometimes in my unbelief is, where's God? He's not here. He's just not here. And listen, listen. I'm your pastor, I believe in God, I believe he exists, I believe he created all things, but functionally, what I'm saying is I'm functionally acting atheistically, aren't I? About my worry when I say that. He's not around, he doesn't exist in my worry. This text teaches us something different, doesn't it? The second thing that I often say to myself, and maybe you say this to yourself, he may be here, but it doesn't seem like he cares very much. And listen, I'm not a deist. I don't believe that God just started this thing like a watchmaker and he's taken his hands off and he just doesn't care. But functionally in those moments, there is an unbelief that resembles functional deism, isn't there? We tell ourselves that, that he doesn't care, that he's not there. The third thing that we tell ourselves is this, or I do, this is too big. I've got to deal with this. God can't deal with this. I have to. He's just really not powerful enough, or it doesn't seem that way, that he's powerful enough to deal with this in my life. I'm not an open theist. <laughs> On paper. But functionally, what I'm saying is, I believe God's around, but my actions are determinative, and God's not going to change those, and he's, nor is he powerful enough to change where I'm at. That's open theism. So functionally, I say, God's not powerful enough in my hard spot, in my trouble. God doesn't care enough, or God's not really here. Anybody there, or is it just me? That's unbelief in the, in the character of God, that he does care, that he is here, and he's active. And in all those scenarios... And all those scenarios that I just painted that I struggle with, I'm going to assume you struggle with. In unbelief, guess what's left? Just you. Just you. You trying to deal with your own problems, which leads to what? Worry. Anxiety. See, God is present. You see, he does care. He powerfully works. And here's the challenge. Let's just be honest. Sometimes with the challenges that we face. Sometimes he chooses to let us stay in it. Sometimes he chooses that to work not only good, but to help grow us. Sometimes, i.e. Paul, he doesn't remove, and that, that's killing me. <laughs> I am so ADD, y'all, I'm sorry. Somebody play some music. Uh, sometimes he doesn't remove the thorn in the flesh. Sometimes he leaves it. This light momentary affliction that in the realm of eternity won't matter. But he leaves it. He leaves it to help us grow, to make us more dependent on him. And that's a hard message. But he's providentially and sovereign in all those things. See also the cross, right? See also the cross. We're sinful, we're in trouble. God is there. Christ is there. He dies for our sins, that's care. And he powerfully rose. He's present, he works. And yet, Jesus, what did Jesus ask for? The same thing that you asked for and I asked for in my trouble and in my hurt and in my pain. Would you remove this from me? 
Did God remove the cross from Jesus? He didn't. Despising the shame, he went to the cross and he was faithful in the blessing of that for you and me. Forgiveness, eternal life. Do you know that message? I want to talk just briefly, if I can keep it brief. I've had some anxiety about this this week. I really have. And how to do this and how to shepherd this. There's an elephant in the room here, isn't there? When we're on the topic of anxiety, the topic of worry and where it stems from and what we do with it. There's a lot of different thoughts across different um, flavors of counseling, from biblical counseling to Christian counseling to secular counseling. You've got all kinds of thoughts. And I've been to the biblical counselor. I've been to the Christian counselor. Maybe you've been to all of them. And you have different thoughts on how we work this out, right? And I want to be somewhat sensitive to that, but I want to teach the text and leave the text with you. That Jesus says to stop doing it because it lacks faith, and we're about to get to some of the antidotes, but I think we have to do this. I think it's helpful to really press into this. First, Jesus will acknowledge in a couple of verses that trouble and anxiety will be with us, that we're going to have to deal with it. So I don't think he's saying it just goes away. We're going to have to battle it. We're going to have to struggle with it. But I think there's a couple of things that happen for us as believers. I think there's a difference in saying as a believer in Jesus, because maybe you're here and maybe you look at this and you say, I have struggled with anxiety, depression, et cetera, all my life. It's, there's a sense in which it's, it's built in that I have that bent that I've always struggled with it, and maybe somebody else struggles with something else, but that's my thing. That's the thing that I struggle with most. And somebody else could go, you know, I struggle with anger. Like my dad, like my grandfather, and I think that's real. Or I struggle with addiction. It's always looming. Or maybe even like today, we have people in our world and in the church, I struggle with same-sex attraction. All these kinds of things. There's a difference. Here's what I want to say, okay? Loving. There's a difference between struggle and fighting it and saying, God, help me in this, right? That's a beautiful place to be with the struggle that you have. That's a beautiful place to be because you're leaning on the Lord and saying, this is my struggle. I need you. I need the body of Christ. I need people to help me. But there is a commitment in that, isn't there, to go, I need to battle this. I need to take, I don't need to roll my eyes at Jesus' words where he says, don't be anxious. I don't need to roll my eyes at the antidotes that seem so trite that Jesus gives me. This is the primary source of truth that you have. And so we ought not treat it lesser than that. But here's what happens sometimes. This is my observation. This is me talking. What happens sometimes for people is they've battled it and they've struggled with it for so long, they get to a place They get to a place that says, okay, I'm going from struggle to acceptance. And by acceptance, I don't mean I accept that I have this, but this is just who I am. That's, now we're talking about identity, right? We're talking about this is how I'm made, this is who I am, and they begin to live into it rather than battling the struggle in a broken, sinful world, a battle that may be part of their makeup, not just in their behavior, but in the brokenness of the body, I think, theologically. Now they're saying something different. Now they're saying, this is just who I am. And what can happen is they just put this circle around themselves and say, I'm not going to battle it anymore. I'm just going to accept it. And you need to accept it too. All the people who want to love me and care for me in it, it's just who I am. And I'm going to live into it. So whether it's anxiety or whether it's anger or whether it's addiction, or whether it's same-sex attraction, there's a shift. And all I want to do to tell you this morning is, as a believer in Jesus, you're made in the image of God, that's your identity, and you're remade. If you know Jesus, you're remade. You're remade in the image of Christ. And yes, our life and sanctification is a battle in every area. We all have different struggles. But if you've gotten to the place where you say, 
this thing is just who I am and it's part of my identity, it may feel like freedom, but I promise you it's bondage. That's what it will be in three years, in five years, in 10 years, if you got asked the question, in that perspective on your struggle, if you got asked the question, how's that working for you? I've never met a person that says, everything's great. And so I want to address, I just wanted to address the elephant in the room and encourage you in whatever you struggle with, whether it's anxiety or other, keep fighting. The Lord is with you. He cares for you. The church is here. And if any of you want to sit down and talk through that, because I, I could, we could talk about that for a really long time, couldn't we? Let's sit down and talk about it. We want to help you. We need one another in the struggles that we have, but we need to maintain that they're struggles and not just who we are. Got it? If that's unclear, let's talk after. I love you. I want to walk through this with anybody. I want to shepherd you through that, but I think that's what the Scripture would call us to do in that with a lot of love and a lot of care. So we've seen the root cause of anxiety, lack of faith, and the character and providence of God. But is there any practical help? I mean, is Jesus just going to leave us with, don't worry, or is he going to give us some help? Are there any antidotes, biblical antidotes, that he's going to give us? Look at it, verse 33 and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, our needs, will be added to you. Therefore, don't be anxious, third time, about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is today with its own troubles or anxieties. Second thought is this, and this is a good one for us. Worry is extinguished by putting first things first and living one day at a time. That's Jesus' message. See, that's what faith looks like. It looks like Jesus being the sinner. It looks like trusting God with today and not worrying so much about tomorrow. If you look at verse 33, what, what in the world does seeking first his kingdom look like? We talked about this last week, didn't we? It looks like these kingdom values in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, it, it looks like not living like last week for earthly treasure but heavenly reward. So let me ask you this morning, what, what's at the center? What's at the center of your life and your pursuits? I don't know about your home. Um, I assume in your home there are different rooms. There's a kitchen, there's a bedroom, there's a living room, there's a dining room, maybe a den, a uh, bathroom, other. Um, when I think about a living room, that's kind of where we think people might live for us. In our home, I think our kitchen is actually our living room. That's where we live anyway. I don't know if it's because we have teenagers and they eat a lot and I got a son who eats like 6,000 calories a day. I don't know. But we also have a brec like the breakfast nook in our, in our kitchen. So a lot of life in our home is actually in our kitchen. That's where we are. There's a bar area. We talk. We hang out there. It's not necessarily the living room. Maybe we should call it that. What, about, what is it for you? Where, where does your family, where's the center of your home? Where's the center of where you talk and spend time together. In most homes, in most Christians' home, homes I go into, there's usually some kind of coffee cup or some kind of frame thing that says, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord, or a verse like that, that this home is centered around Christ. It's interesting. Is God at the center of of your life, if you think of your life as a home, is God at the center of your life? Or is he in the room in your house that you really don't use that much and you're over here? That's what Jesus is getting. First things first, is Jesus at the center? Do you trust him? Do you spend time in his word? Do you spend time in prayer, meeting with him? It's interesting, the scriptures are about prayer. When you, when you look at at these texts in the New Testament about worry and anxiety, oftentimes prayer is wrapped up in it. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. I think we have it here. Where Peter says, he's been speaking to elders about the responsibility to shepherd the church and care for the church and the hard job that it is with all the decisions. 
And then he turns to older and younger in the church, and he says, humble yourselves before the hand, mighty hand of God, so that in proper time he might exalt you. And then what? Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let's talk about Peter. Peter's an older man here. Did Peter do very good in the Gospels about casting his cares on Jesus? How'd he do? Young Peter. How'd he do believing that God, that Jesus cared for him? As opposed to Peter, think about Peter, as opposed to Peter protecting Jesus. Peter was always trying to protect Jesus, wasn't he? I mean, think about the examples in in the Gospels of young Peter. Peter, Peter walking on water, Jesus calling him out. He's bold, like many of us. He has zeal, and he goes out and he turns his eyes away. Is he casting his cares on Jesus in that moment? I'm not sure I'd do any different, but he's not. Think about Peter. Remember when they're talking about paying taxes? He wants to make sure that Jesus is going to pay his taxes, kind of like your dad. He's telling you, you make, make sure you pay your taxes. Remember when Jesus started talking about somebody that would betray him? What did Peter do? He said, not going to be me. Who is it? I'm going to handle it, right? That's Peter. He's going after the guy. He's protecting Jesus. Remember when Jesus says, I'm going to wash the feet of the disciples? Peter's like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're washing my feet. You're too grand for that. I'll wash your feet. Jesus says, you got nothing to do with me. If I don't wash your feet, he says, wash my head, wash my hands, wash it all, right? But Peter was protecting Jesus. You're too high for that lowly position. I'll wash your feet. He's protecting Jesus. He's got a different perspective than Jesus. Remember Jesus' arrest? Peter's life? Jesus had told him a bunch of times what he's about to do. He's about to go to the cross. He's about to die. And he's getting arrested. And what does he do? He cuts off the soldier's ear. He's protecting Jesus. He's caring for Jesus. And all the time, Jesus is trying to care for him. And then we get to his denial, right? Where he denies Jesus three times. Is he casting his cares upon the Lord? Is he done? Three times. But here's the beauty. You see Peter at the sea, and Jesus shows up. And Jesus says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, yes, I'm your friend, I'm your friend. Yes, I love you. See, people who are forgiven much over time go from trying to protect Jesus and care for themselves to going, hey, y'all, Hey, church that I'm talking to, cast your cares on him, your anxieties on him. He cares for you. That ought to be encouragement for you. We spend a lot of our time trying to protect Christianity, don't we? We spend a lot of our time trying to protect Jesus. We spend a lot of our time going, I got this. And the beautiful truth is that as we struggle with these things, The forgiveness and the care of Jesus gets us, like Peter, to a place where we can say and pray, because that's what that is. Cast your cares and anxieties on him, for he cares for you. That's a prayer. That is a bold, heartfelt prayer of desperation. That's where Peter got. There's great encouragement in that. Peter began to put first things first. See, the greatest antidote, one of the greatest antidotes for worry and anxiety is prayer. And that's not a throwaway thing. And maybe you're in a place right now where you go, I've tried that. That doesn't work. It's prayer. It's dependence upon the Lord. You can't be praying and worrying at the same time. But here's the question. What's your reflexive response to trouble? Is it prayer? How far down the list is prayer? Sometimes it's way down the list for me, if I'm honest. I'm going to fix it. Somebody, I'm going to vent to somebody, and that's fine. But how far down the list is it for you in your anxiety and your worry that creeps up? 
This is an antidote that Jesus is giving us. The second antidote is verse 34. Live one day at a time. Listen, we don't worry about yesterday. We might worry about what happened yesterday in relation to what? The future and what we did yesterday that might relate to it. But we don't worry about yesterday. It's over. We only worry about the future. Kids, how many of you got a test? I'm going to bring some worry to you right now. You got a test tomorrow. Teachers, you got that kid already. Three weeks in, and there's that kid in your class. Lord, what do I do? Worry. Big decision at work. Hard conversation at work. You got coming. You're worrying about it. You're thinking about it. You're processing it. My wife says I'm kind of crazy because I talk out loud when I'm on the grass. I'm like, who are you having a conversation with? What are you worried about? She's like, that's kind of weird. And it is. She's right. Been there? Talking to yourself in the car? About whatever it is you're worried about that's coming. It's all future. Election, November 5th. Anybody worried about that? New year, inflation, what's going to happen? My kid's going to graduate. Are they going to pass? Are they going to turn out to be citizens, good citizens? Are they going to know Jesus? I mean, I could just keep going. Now I'm just giving you all this word. But it's all future. Story of a guy that was talking to his buddy. He's like, man, you look totally stressed out. Two guys talking. You're stressed. Guy responds, if something else goes wrong today, I'll have to wait two weeks until I get around to worrying about it. That's kind of funny. (laughs) This guy thought, in reality, he had a two-week tank that he could put everything in. And Jesus is saying, you don't got two weeks. You don't even have two days. You got one day. It's today. Your worry. Today has enough worries of its own. You can't worry about tomorrow. You're finite. You don't have the ability to take today and tomorrow, more or less, two weeks and worry about that deal. But this is what we do. So, worry, extinguish. Think about the fire being, little fires being extinguished by putting first things first and living one day at a time. Two beautiful antidotes for us. Hard to do, but beautiful antidotes for us to take one day at a time and put Jesus first and put him in the center. There's a story about a guy, first century, named Titius Amerinos. And the first part of his name is a proper name, but the second part is made up of the Greek word to worry. Because apparently this guy, as an unbeliever, was marked by worry. It's kind of like having a name where uh, it's a descriptor of who you are, like Frederick the Great or Ivan the Terrible. So this was Amerinos the Worrier. And this man later on came to know Christ in a radical way. And the story goes that they changed his name to Tidia Do, which means a man who never worries. The beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus is that while we will continue to have worry and anxiety every day in front of us, that God makes us new. He remakes us into the image of his son to be more and more conformed to the image of his son And so there is power available to you to put worry and anxiety in the the right place, to put it in the place where God wants us to put it, to truly, to take Jesus' word seriously, to say, you don't have to be anxious. You can trust his providential care. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the grass. He can take care of you. Trust him. I'm going to end with Philippians 4, 19. Philippians 4, 19 says this. I want you to hear this. My God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Trust the promises, y'all. Trust the promises and the providence of God. He's got you. Let me pray. Father, in many ways, this is a challenging text for for many of us who carry anxiety, who worry, who struggle with stress and struggle with the temptations each and every day. So, Lord, we pray 
Um, for each of us in here, we pray that we would put the things that come up in our hearts and our minds in the right place, and we pray that we would truly believe the words of Jesus, that there is a place that we can put our anxiety, that we can cast our cares on him, for he cares for us, that we could believe today an active grace that you give us, that you could believe today that, that you can handle it, that you're working for our good. So give us a heart and eyes of faith, an active faith that maybe and often we don't have to trust you with our lives, what we eat, what we drink, like you do the little things, like you do the birds and the lilies and the grass. Would you give us a heart of trust? And would that illumine for people around us what it means to follow Jesus, maybe people in our lives that are riddled with worry and fear, would it be salt and light for them in a broken world? We love you and we thank you for time together this morning in Jesus' name, amen.